Hello there, my name is Victoria Kennefick and on behalf of Listowel Writers Week, I'm delighted to welcome you to this celebration of the poetry pamphlet. During the course of this event, we'll explore and discuss the poetry pamphlet, which has never been more popular. Listen to some wonderful poems from um, a new beautiful poetry pamphlet from The Well Review by Tom Moore and talk about um, the submission window of The Well Review that's open for the month of June with the editor of The Well Review, um, the lovely Sarah Byrne. So it's going to be this June and we'll talk about it uh, later on in our discussion. Um, the submission is open basically this month. Um, but I'll start, before we get there, I'll start by introducing our wonderful guests and then we'll talk about all things poetry pamphlet. Sarah Byrne is a writer and editor based in Paris. Her own poetry has appeared in Poetry Ireland Review, The Irish Examiner, Prelude and in various anthologies. She has received awards for her work from the Cork County and City Councils and the Art Council of Ireland. She is editor and founder of The Well Review, a non-profit arts organisation founded in 2016, focusing on publishing pamphlets, expanding its education programme and mentoring unpublished writers. The Well Review regularly collaborates with festivals and arts organisations to showcase the world's most exciting writers and artists, and it has received funding from the Arts Council of Ireland since 2018. Tom Moore is a poet and academic scientist. His first poetry pamphlet is Brother Adam, published by the Rell Review in 2020. He works at UCC, where he directs the BSc genetics degree programme, and his research sounds absolutely fascinating, including the genetics of autism and the biology of maternal fetal interactions. His poetry has appeared in the Irish Examiner, The Moth, Southward, The Well Review, and he has won first prize in the Moth International Poetry Prize in 2012. We're so delighted to have you here, Sarah and Tom, and I only wish that we were maybe sitting on the stage, um, on stage in St. John's Theatre, and maybe afterwards going to the Arms for a drink or going to John B's. And um, hopefully soon we'll all get an opportunity to do that. And in the meantime, this is a wonderful way to celebrate all that you're doing at the Well Review and to talk about the poetry pamphlet. Sarah, um, if I could come to you first, could you tell us a little bit more about the Well Review um, and how you set it up and maybe what your vision for the future of the organisation is? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, I'd always been interested in design for like a very long time, but I wanted to be a fashion designer, <laughs> but I didn't have any sewing skills or very limited spatial awareness. So that presented a problem for that type of profession. But no, I was always completely preoccupied with presentation. I used to make magazines as a child, make uh, invitations. And then I suppose my life became incredibly textually focused. So um, in terms of academia and the profession I had for 10 years, I used to write a lot of uh, court reports and psychological reports. So I was dealing constantly with text all the time. And a lot of the time it wasn't very creative. So when I met my partner at the time, Christian, who's a co-founder of The Well Review, he was a graphic designer and a visual designer. So yeah, it was a meeting of minds. So basically my kind of lifetime of reading and his lifetime of sort of producing art, we decided to set up the magazine um, uh, to, I suppose, three things to support new work out there to sort of celebrate the work that had added meaning to our lives over the years and to produce something that reflected our own tastes and um values to a degree but mainly our own tastes so yeah that's how it sort of was founded and we found ourselves in a really um sort of enigma enigmatic neighborhood in cork which is sunday as well um, and yeah, it was sort of me the meeting of two people, a location and sort of the right time um, in both of our lives. And yeah, so that's how it all so kind of- Alchemy, it sounds like it was almost <laughs> alchemical and meant to be. Um, and so you're moving forward with the organization and, and we'll talk about the pamphlets um, later on and how you, how you came to decide to do those. Um, but Tom, how did you become familiar with the Well Review and how long have you been writing and how did you um, get involved with that organization? Yeah, so the um, Cork, uh, in addition to being enigmatic, is uh, small. Um, so there's pretty much, uh, you know, there's a lot of activity 
in uh, art and literature and it, you know everybody knows everybody else i think it's a small community uh, at least geographically there are a lot of people actually and people coming and going and so ucc has a pretty active um you know set of programs where external people are, are involved people from the community creative people and about um 2012 when matthew sweeney was uh, running workshops um, at, at UCC. That's really when I sort of woke up. I've been reading poetry since my teens, um, but and obviously a few maybe abortive attempts at writing, but nothing very sustained. But Matthew was really a, a revelation in his workshop, and so I kind of got more, um, you know, involved in the local scene at that stage. And there just seemed to be a lot of. Um, activity readings in the Glucksman, you know, just uh, so it, it all sort of led to a, a feeling of energy and activity around the poetry thing. And that's, I wouldn't say it's probably there at the same level at the moment. It's tailed off a little bit, but, um, you know, but certainly for four or five years. And I would say Matthew was the, for me, at any rate, the sort of um, the kingpin of the, of, you know, he just had an aura about him that spread outwards. Um, and that, that, I think, he was a huge sort of source of energy for, for everybody in the area. And, and then, yeah, and, and such a huge loss to the poetry community, and particularly the poetry community in Cork. As you say, such a vibrant and such a, um, an inspiring person and so funny, such a funny, witty, yeah, lively person. Absolutely, yeah. um, So is that how you, in, um, how you first met Sarah or how did you get involved? Yeah, I think, you... uh, well, Sarah, you tell me, I can't remember. <laughs> I guess there was probably alcohol involved somewhere. Um, but yeah, yeah, it would have been. I think maybe it was at a UCC reading, maybe the yeah, one possibly. that Mary Moon and early Anna Sullivan used to create. Um, uh, some sort of reading series, if not, then maybe a writing workshop, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Or, or it could have been after the, you know, the, um, the an annual uh, poetry festival in Cork, yeah, um, bar, sure. possibly in the bar, you know. Uh, and so there's great mixing and um, energy again around the, you know, the the after the after hours of the of the Cork uh, now international poetry uh, festival, I think. Um, so yeah, there's a great community there and a lot of activity and everybody's meeting everybody else. So I think, you know, what I'm hearing really, I suppose, is the importance of getting involved in your community if you're interested in writing and taking every opportunity, whether it's online now in, in these times or indeed ideally in person. And, you know, even going to the, the wonderful workshops that um, List Old Writers Week offer to, you know, that you, you meet your people, don't you? And that's how yeah. you kind yeah. of um, find your way and gain confidence, as you say, under the, the tutelage of, of wonderful um, mentors like Sarah and like um, like Matthew. Um, you have a very interesting day job, Tom. Yeah, and well. I, it sounds interesting <laughs> to me anyway, um, looking at genetics and so on. And, and reading the collection, there seems to be definitely um, a symbiotic relationship perhaps between your day job and, and your themes in your poetry. Could you talk to us a little bit yeah. about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not sure themes, but but maybe the language, um, you know, so I use the language that, that I use, I guess, and that um, a large part of my day and my thought process is, is around the language of science, either teaching or um, writing research grants or, um, you know, writing papers. Um, so um, I think it's probably inevitable. That's not a kind of a conscious decision to write sciencey poems in fact I'd be slightly offended at that label um, but uh, you know I think inevitably um, you know that the, the language and the words come into it and I do feel you know if you take something like one of what's the greatest team in poetry love I guess um, but you know I'd have a particular genetic view of love and um, <laughs> you know of relationships um, including the maternal fetal relationship, you know, parental love, I guess, but, but all sorts of love. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I think that I can't write a, a naive love poem because, I, you know, I think I understand a lot about what, how it evolved and, you know, the genetics of it, if you like. It doesn't sound very romantic, but, um, but you know, I think you have to, your launch pad has to be your own version of our understanding of reality, I guess that's, that's the way I put it. Um, mm -hmm. 
And very much, I suppose, that notion of write what you know as well, that this is, as you say, your language and this is the world that you're inhabiting and, and the, the terms and so on that you're familiar with. And I think it's really interesting, you know, as more, I think, scientists in particular start to write poetry or interact more with the artistic world, um, that there's so much in common, you know, that I, I for detail and that questioning mind. So mm -hmm. it, it, sends, it, it almost gives your, your work... Um, a deeper or a certainly alternative view of, of reality of, of what's going on. Um, Sarah, what was it about, about Tom's work that stood out to you when you initially, did you initially publish him in the magazine, is it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I had been familiar with his work since his Moth Prize and um, all my closest sort of friends uh, in my personal life are scientists. So it's like, it's a really sort of valuable and meaningful way that I understand um, my own world. Um, and um, I suppose Tom's got an excellent sense of humor. <laughs> and yeah, I liked the way he was presenting nature um, in its sort of paradoxes that um, it wasn't something that was just beautiful or something that was brutal, but that there's always a sort of uh, reminder or sort of clue that nature is always being sort of two things, you know? So this constant paradox, I think he takes poems like experiments as far as they can go. So like for me, he's a very full developed sort of rigorous poet, which is like, I suppose, very much practices of science. So I had sort of no doubt after I saw his manuscripts that it was, you know, um, the, sort of without being negative but just being realistic the last thing you want to do is read a manuscript by someone you, you admire and think god like I need to put in about 60% of the work in this <laughs> because that's like it's unethical because it becomes sort of like a collaboration but it also is it's I suppose it's just unethical really is the main word I'm looking for but when I read Tom's pamphlet um to see something so complete was just joyful. It was just very joyful and a relief that we weren't going to have to have, you know, dozens and dozens of really awkward conversations <laughs> about change that, change that, change that, you know, anyway, he would have told me to F off. <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, no, uh, I think this sort of the fact that Tom takes his work as far as it can go, which is something that takes time, it, means putting yourself at risk and it means putting the language at risk I think is it was a sort of a no-brainer for me really yeah wonderful and you know you've kind of covered a little bit there but what do you think makes a good pamphlet as opposed to maybe a full collection obviously being much longer and do you have any particular pamphlet obviously besides Tom's that um, you admire, you like, and why do you think maybe, there are a lot of questions here, why do you think the pamphlet is becoming more popular as a form and becoming, I suppose, a way of um, writers and poets, not necessarily even who are starting out, but even you know, established writers, that they're using or are using the pamphlet as a means to um, publish small selections of poems? Bear with me, I'll just try and that was a lot. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, no. Why do I? I think the pamphlet was around, I guess, in the 19th and 20th century. Um, I suppose it's specifically at the start of the 10th century, it was really important for like political uh, reasons, uh, either propaganda or actually resistance and stuff. I'm thinking of people like the Akimists during the 20s, like Marina Sviteva and people like that who used to bring out short essays or pamphlets. I think really it's, um, without trying to pun on science, it is like an antidote to just like a really saturated, digital, overloaded world. Like there's something really quiet and elegant about a pamphlet. It's almost like a little secret or something. And I think the fact that you can be sure that a pamphlet's not going to be, you know, made into a Netflix series or, you know, like... So I feel, yeah, I feel that people do as much as people want to connect online. And obviously this is a gorgeous space for us to have today. There is a sense of that human beings will always want something like antidotal, like something quiet and softer and simply 
just slow. So there's something very slow as well about the way we make our pamphlet in the sense that um, we use Badly Made Books, who is a handbook binder as well. So I can't really say, I can't really say what makes a good pamphlet. I'm not sure if I can say that. I think a good poet makes a good pamphlet. I really admire your pamphlet, uh, Victoria White Whale from Southward, um, uh, very much so when that came out. Um, there's also the American University of Paris. They bring out essay pamphlets. Um, just any, like any little indie press that are doing pamphlets, there's just something to admire in all of them. The M Press, Southward. Um, yeah, I, I just, I suppose it is that alchemy you were talking about earlier when I was discussing the magazine. It's, it's a meeting of editor, poet, design. It's kind of a, yeah, I think that's sort of what makes a good pamphlet. Um, yeah, me and Tom talked about themes a little bit, Tom, didn't we? And just sort of didn't really dig that deep into deciding on themes. Sure, we didn't. No, I think it's just poems. They're just poems. Poems yeah. one after the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in that sense, I guess there's obviously way more um, pressure on a poet and publisher to maybe have that arc in, in a collection. Whereas a pamphlet can be kind of just like, I don't know, kind of series of whispers, you know. That's a lovely way of describing it, a series of whispers. That's beautiful. Tom, um, we might mute and, and uh, disappear for a little while. And you might share with us some of the beautiful poems from um, Brother Adam. Um, so beautifully produced. And, and when you said, Sarah, you know, that it's, it's, you know, design is so important as well. I think that really rings true with the pamphlet, doesn't it? That it's even more integral to the publication than even if it was, you know, a full collection. There's something about them being artworks in and of themselves. It's as, it's as important for me as the poems, like 100%. You know, the poems are the poems are the fabric and the minerals and the sort of raw materials that have been made the best they can be made. And then, you know, you have, you have to pattern them and, and present them. Like you have to give, I mean, Tom has been writing these poems for years. Um, so I have to, I always feel the obligation to come up with a cover and a production that honors that, you know what I mean? Like, cause Tom has given that his love and time. Yeah, very much so. Well, we're looking forward to hearing Tom. I guess I'm the boss for five or ten minutes. Um, so I'm going to start with a, a shortish poem. Um, we've talked a lot, a lot about Cork, so I spent a lot of my time in London. Um, and so the first poem I'll read is called Properties of London. We begin by specifying outgroup and baseline, say, yellow monkey flowers of Copperopolis and built on water. Sighting along the stage road to Sonora out of Sacramento, ankle deep in rattlers, we select metropolis within the orbital. City is now one fifth the mass of earth placating asteroids, death of Pompeii, one tall inch within the British Museum. City rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls, fell flat in 41. Elsewhere, copper surged on tides of two world wars. The Manhattan plot of Canary Wharf took a bad bite of sky from the sifting sun, but gums of estuary still shine. Not everything scales as Y equals KX. Joint insects buckle to cupolas, narrowly missing the runaway buggies. And the next poem I'll read um, is called The Fish Behind My Shoulder, which uh, Sarah kindly tweeted recently. Um, so, so that's, uh, it's based on a, a, a dream or it's almost like a waking dream. Um, and I was having issues with my right shoulder around the time I wrote this poem. He's been there for weeks, the fish behind my shoulder. At first, I thought it was muscle spasm. My upper arm ached at the time and was vulnerable to psychosomatosis or synesthesia. But that cleared up and still he's there like a persistent lesion. He's definitely not a cleaner fish attending to parasites and dead tissue, at least not that I've noticed. 
a freshwater species, I'm sure, because I've felt the gravel beds scarred by freshets and the runs made by baby eels. Of course, I've never seen him. He's brown, though, with a pale lemon underside, like my forearm at the end of summer. His mouth work is robotic, but he's not averse to a playful flick of his tail or a sudden rush and faint that starts and stops without seeming to. I have had to learn to take care of myself when starting, in case I shatter something I can't quite comprehend. I have begun to think of him as my twin. We might be joined at a fin. I face into things now, watch my back. So just, uh, I haven't really made a list of what I was going to read. I think I'll read Brother Adam next. Um, so this is dedicated to Mick and Kathleen Wolfe from Middleton, uh, stalwarts of the Middleton community. And it's based on the, the life of um, a, a German monk who spent most of his life in the, in the UK, in England. And it's a sort of a commentary um, on his life, but also on what was going on in, in, in Europe and around his life over the, the last century. So Brother Adam for Mick and Kathleen Wolf. The past is a foreign country. So is its synonym, Germany. His mother posts the 12 year old Carl Curley to the novitiate of the Benedictines of St. Mary's Abbey. In Germany, it will always be 1910. Unhappy novice, a mason's lot is not in your heart. Come down and help Brother Columban with the bees. Carl, it is 1916 and all the bees are dying. Carl, how fair your countrymen at Eep. The weather is unpredictable here, but Dartmoor offers the prospect of a second honey flow in August. Then the nectar is from heather, hawthorn, sycamore. All of this has happened here before. He is unmatched as a breeder of bees. He talks to them, strokes them. He brings a calmness that, according to those who see him work, the bees respond to. He does so while being carried backwards up Kilimanjaro. But let the bees tell you, haunting his own motto, he becomes one of nature's silent workers. The bees keep leading him to yarrow, self-heal, poppy. This is how he escapes the 20th century. French scientists in the 30s proved that bees can't fly, but he is down in the spinney retrieving a swarm. A bee's wings beat more than 200 times a second. He has fallen asleep over Professor Armbruster's laws. Two prized queens are stolen from the Buckfast apiaries. Police issue the following description. Three quarters of an inch in length with dark brown and dark gray stripes. Cal Curly, Cal Curly, wake up, wake up. A worker has space, but no time, no time, no time. A worker is her own landing craft and centripetal spoke, homing her cargo to the vortex of the hive. How to woo a honeybee with veils and gloves and smoke. So I'll just uh, flip back here. And so next to the, the fish, there's a poem about a kingfisher. So the kingfisher is obviously one of the most beautiful birds, aesthetically pleasing birds in, in, in Ireland and Europe. Um, and uh, when I was a kid, I used to watch them a lot. We have a river running uh, by the, uh, the ancestral home, if you like, um, just outside Middleton. And so in addition to the aesthetic aspect of the kingfisher, there's the, the genetic aspect, I guess, and the evolutionary aspect. So that's really um, what's addressed in this poem to some extent. It's, it's sort of founded on a, a book by Richard Dawkins called The Extended Phenotype. Uh, and this is dedicated to Walter Mills and his wife, Yvonne, uh, whom I visit every summer to talk uh, evolution uh, with in Norwich in the UK. Kingfisher. The kingfisher is not just a dash of local color, not color TV for sticklebacks and wrens, no. It is simply itself in the lost and found grotto of the British Natural History Museum under the rapturous eyes of Darwin and Huxley. And it is a falsifiable tremor in the gene pool which would have pleased Peter Meadowar. In fact, 
It is more than it knows of itself as its phenotype extends beyond the shitty nest hole and the bare branch posed by trapper or photographer. And please note that this bird invented a gun for exuberant Victorians, Kodachrome, in this poem. So I will, um, I'll read uh, two more poems, I guess, if unless somebody stops me. Uh, so the first one is uh, Lascaux, which is the amazing place in France. Near, near, Sarah is the nearest one of us to it at the moment. Um, the, the, the famous cave paintings. And um, this is dedicated to my wife, Carl. And it's not about necessarily, but it's certainly heavily influenced by the life of um, her father, my father-in-law, Ron Robinson, who had dealings with Mr. Hitler back in the, back in the day. Um, so let's go. Robot the dog has found a hole. He growls and loops back to the boys. Arriving in the great hall of the bulls, they halt. Hitler fondles his ears, his blue eyes shine. The rabbit disappears down a black hole. Swift and sure, your father crosses open ground in Cambridgeshire, then ships out to the desert from Southampton docks. Pure Point arrives in London within the week. The boy is lowered on a rope. The entrance is sealed by a fall of rock. Black mold waits in a matchless dark. His breath is blue as his heart, the face an ochre mask. The lights go out. A sullen red glow flares over London. Crystal Palace's teleosaurs abide. He clears gold beach alive. Rommel swallows his bitter sword and dies. The votive boy puts a soft hand to the cave wall and blows his absence into time. The ice goes north. He buries two cadets lost to a cider brandy jag. He scores two morphine serrets, which have a price. Hitler burns. He takes his first flight. In East London, he secures a mortgage, eschews religions, raises two beloved children, signs 50,000 chits for Essex oil with brisk, upright strokes that end to end would not tax the heartbeats of his long and unremitting working life. Your father, at 89, awakes to intense pain, recoils from morphine proffered by the artless locum who could be his grandson. He has moved to an annex to die. The trace tautens and flattens and of him leaves no sign. And finally, I will read, if I can find him, um, Carl Inez's uh, Herbarium Cabinet. So this is dedicated to Dean Brown and it was uh, Dean who picked up on another Linnaeus poem uh, in a workshop that we attended. Um, and it was Sarah who bullied me into writing a second Linnaeus poem, which is the one I'm going to read. And I thank Sarah for that. <laughs> Uh, and also Sarah was really instrumental in um, Brother Adam, uh, in addition to John, me, uh, in the workshop that, that I attend fairly regularly with John. So Carl Linnaeus's Herbarium Cabinet for Dean Brown. His classification system was based on the sexual organs. He himself was the type specimen for Homo sapiens, there being no other example to hand with which he had sufficient intimacy. Sarah, Lisa, and the children numbered eight in total. Johan died aged three. Carl Jr. never married, ending the von Linne name. You will count 200 descendants through two daughters. Christopher Tarnstrom, his first apostle, was a youngish pastor. He boarded the East India Company ship Kalmar for China, but died en route in Vietnam. Tarnstrom's widow tarred Linnaeus with making her children fatherless. Thereafter, he preferred to send out younger unmarried students, six of whom died on their expeditions. He himself never again left Sweden. Linnaeus sectioned his herbarium cabinet after the number of stamens of plants he himself had pressed onto loose sheets. After his death, his collection sold to Sir James Edward Smith, who founded the Linnaean Society of London five years later. Granovius named Linnaeus's favorite flower, Linnae borealis, little twin flower, edelweiss of pine heats and old Finnish forests. 
Following in Linnaeus's footprints in Swedish Lapland in 2017, James Prozek wrote in the New York Times, on a walk along the Lule River where it met the bay, we found a species of willow, Salix pentandra, a leaf of which Linnaeus drew near this spot. Staffan plucked a leaf from the tree and laid it on the facsimile of the journal. It matched perfectly as if Linnaeus himself had traced that very leaf. Thank you very much. Over to you, Victoria. It's really lovely to hear. Um, and were you always, I suppose, were you always very intentional that you were writing a pamphlet? And, and as you were writing it, were there any particular challenges and joys that you experienced in the process? Um, I know, I mean, pamphlet didn't really, I still don't agree with the term, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? <laughs> well, it's a book, isn't it? It's a little book. Look, it's, it's got pages and a cover. It's as big as Elizabeth Bishop's, uh, anything Elizabeth Bishop ever published. Uh, so yeah. our door, door into the dark, Heaney. Um, I think, uh, you know, so I, yeah, I actually, um, um, sorry now, Sarah, if I'm going to disembowel some of your previous, uh, a little bit skeptical about the, the whole idea that there's some qualitative difference between a, a pamphlet and the, and the, and the book. Um, now, I guess, look, let's be serious, there is, um, you know, because a, a pamphlet can be much more focused um, you know, books, uh, poetry books nowadays are maybe getting too <laughs> uh, exuberant, you know, in terms of the, the numbers of poems and um, is there a pressure on, you know, the people who have, who have to make a living from it potentially to, you know, to produce? Uh, I guess there is. Um, and of course, you do need volume so that the, the, the critical community can get stuck into you. I think that's important. You know, I, I mean, I genuinely think that you do need a body of work, um, and I've discussed it. I, I discussed this with Matthew Sweeney once, and he sort of, I think, was of that view. He was quite prolific. Um, that you, you know, if you're going to develop a, a, a group of readers of your work, then there has to be you have to feed them, I guess. So I think the pamphlet, um, yeah, it can be a focused collection. It can be a starter pack for a young poet, or it could be. Uh, something and I think this this is me really somebody who's very busy with other stuff um, but does love poetry and occasionally manages to write some to be able to put a you know coherent uh, mini collection together and get it out there so I would say that's where I would sit with the the, the idea of the pamphlet and very grateful to Sarah for um, taking it up taking it up and doing such a great job. I think that's fascinating because I think even in what you're saying it kind of encapsulates for me and I think maybe a little bit with what Sarah was saying about that rebellious nature of the pamphlet and that it, it you know, defies categorization and it can be really anything that you want it to be, which is why it's so exciting as a form. I'm thinking of Liz Berry's um, Republic of Motherhood, which, you know, she writes um, full collections, but she brought out this very special, beautiful pamphlet. Um, I think with uh, Chat on Windows, I think, um, and it, just about her experience of, of motherhood. Um, and, and so it was quite, as you say, very focused in its theme. So I think um, I think it's OK to be um, dubious about whatever form you, you are um, lucky enough to be published in. I think that's healthy. And I think mm. that, that 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 pamphlet, it's always been, I suppose, um, as Sarah was saying to us earlier, a place of rebellion or, you know, you think of Countess Markovich making her um, yeah. her, um, her pamphlet. <laughs> and even there's a new movie called Mocky on Netflix. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen it about zines and you were kind of talking about zines earlier, Sarah. You know, just yeah. very independent, um, elegant, free thinking out there publications that you can, you know, bypass maybe the more traditional, more pressurized um, publishing experiences. Um, so I think that's really interesting, um, Tom. Thanks so much. Um, Sarah, maybe you could take us through editing, Tom, or your editing process in particular. Uh, I was just what your philosophy say, might be. Uh, I was just going to say, it reminds me of kind of what's happened to the EP in music, which was like an EP was a band's kind of foot in the door, down to lots of like market reasons, like finances, experience and things like that. But now like a lot of musicians, you know, they release mixtapes and EPs between albums and stuff. So it can just be anything. It can just be like a sort of... Um, just a particular flavor or like, I like that you say it's rebellious. I really think it is. Well, I think it may have started 
in its infancy something around like the debutantes like very much like this is what I have so far you know but I think it's really evolved um my editing philosophy I think I hope it changes over time um <laughs> but my editing can I ask you what you mean by that is that okay of course yeah so I suppose um different editors have different um priorities I suppose and so, you know, when you come to a manuscript like Tom's or another manuscript, say the ones that maybe you're going to be looking at overdue, you know, yeah. what you, um, obviously you're initially looking at, you know, the poet's skill and, and where they take you and so on. But um, I suppose, what do you look, what do you, where do you go to first? And do you have like a list of priorities that you move through or is it more organic than that? Um, it's very hard to pin down because a lot of it's to do with taste and that's built up over a lifetime you know, that's built up over the, source, the course of your life. Um, my probably editing philosophy is quite radical and then I adjust. So it would be like, I want to read something that I've never read before and I will never read again. So no pressure. <laughs> um, uh, I very much want to see ideas brought to their absolute sort of, you know, like a flower brought to their blossom, almost on the verge of, you know, exhaustion, but not quite. Something I describe in classes a lot is that um, if you were to leave, let's say the poem was a human being or some sentient uh, force that you could leave it on its own and it would survive. So like, think about what a human being needs to survive, you know, food, shelter, whatever, all, all those kind of things, that you have fed the poem enough, that you have looked after the poem enough, that you've literally given the poem its best start in life. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that, you know, someone doesn't walk into your poetry book and go, oh, that poem is dead. Someone left it there and didn't look after it. <laughs> so it's a kind of a like metaphorical and quite dramatic way of looking at it, but that poems are tended to and cared for just with, meticulousness and tenderness and all the things that any work of art needs to survive so again no pressure there but yeah that would be my editing philosophy that would very much be my reading philosophy I read voraciously and have done for many years and it would be my sort of philosophy to my own work as well is that there the, the problem Victoria is if there are too many gaps like say you're creating a home, if there are too many gaps, too many people can get in and that's not what you want. You don't want to have so many gaps in the structure that anyone can sneak in and change it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There you go. That's a beautiful way of putting it, honestly, and that it is a home and that it is something that you need to tend to and look after and give attention to. And um, Tom, how did you find working under those conditions? <laughs> now, now we get to it. <laughs> no, it, it was great. Very, very um, professional <laughs> is the first word I would say. Um, uh, I would say low key, actually. And so, you know, there was no shouting and roaring. We met a few times um, in the the River Lee Hotel, and uh, and just you know went through it. And um, I, I, I guess I, I was I, yeah, I was a little bit shocked once or twice when uh, Sarah <laughs> asked me to change. A few things in some of the poems and I you know that's what I wasn't expecting I, I thought it might it would be um, you know will we put them in this order or that order and actually the order which I think works really well with Sarah's entirely Sarah's um, so I, I resisted on some of the you know the specific requests and I did change and for the better you know some some small things um, you know in previously published poems so I'm grateful for that um, uh, but, um, and, and, you know, Sarah never really pushed, 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 you know, it, and so, um, well, she did a little bit and <laughs> <laughs> I think on one occasion I did ask her to change it herself if she didn't like it or something. <laughs> yes, she did. Yes, she did. <laughs> and, and, and she didn't, uh, in, in deference to her. Uh, so yeah, it was, no, it was fine. And, um, you know, I left, um, maybe too much to Sarah, you know, I, I, the poems were there. And um, as I said, like Brother Adam actually was the last poem to be written. Uh, it's the last one in the book. And it was really, it wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Sarah putting a bit of a push on me to, you know, come up with, you know, I think there was just some, 
an extra poem may be required um, and there are other ones which weren't included then and it, it you know it did it changed um, I think it pulled it together actually the, the collection you know the themes um, and it changed the, the cover I think um, uh, which had already been planned so it, you know that was quite a significant input from Sarah which really changed the nature of the the, the final product I guess. I think you've both highlighted so beautifully the really um, important nature of the writer editor um, experience and that, you know, you have to be open, I suppose, Tom, as a writer, don't you, to um, the ideas and the advice of an editor. And it's a real privilege, isn't it, to have an editor. It's, it's something that everyone dreams of if they write, but equally being able to be open and humble, I suppose. And yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, anybody who who attends a workshop is used to getting battered anyway. So it's not really, that's not really. I guess the issue is when you feel in your own head, and when a different editor of a magazine tells you that you've got a finished poem, and then somebody comes along and you know starts to debate, it, then that that that, that that's, that's the bit that surprised me. I guess, but everybody's taste is different, and you're I right. I mean, an editor is essentially a reader who's really really engaged like professionally engaged in your work and you don't get a better reader than that or a more engaged reader Sarah were you going to say something um, what was I going to say yeah I think it's important to remember the power dynamics as well because a lot of people get worried that an editor just knows all the answers and the writer doesn't especially if your confidence is you know like if you're young or in development or, you know, you can, you can lack confidence at 60 or 70. It doesn't matter what age you are. But, you know, I think that that's really important to stand your ground on things and not just think an editor is, is producing or leading this project. Just to not sort of think, you know, like sometimes we do in school, you know, just that the, the, the teacher is right and we're wrong. It's just to have more space around, like really stand your ground on things. I think me and Tom argued about a verb like one verb for like three or four weeks and um yeah just to like there's the flexibility that has to always stay kind of on the surface when you're working with an editor um obviously not to get into like very antagonistic sort of development but um yeah it's just don't don't presume that the editor knows everything either i think that's really important you know and that's very important to take along with um you know, uh, I think people underestimate taste. They really do, you know, like think of all the designers in the world and all the musicians in the world. We can't all like the same thing. So I think not to think an editor is omnipotent and also like a lot of the decision does come down to taste. It really does, you know. So That's a really, really important point. And I think it's a point that a lot of poets don't think about. And certainly even when I'm submitting or when I'm, um, even entering competitions, I've learned to kind of look at the judge and go, oh, is that something you might like what I'm doing? Or, you know, are they looking for something else? Um, Sarah, I'm going to um, ask you to read your favourite poem from Tom's pamphlet, and you might tell us a little bit about why you chose it. And um, Tom, if you wouldn't mind um, muting and disappearing sure. for a minute, that's okay. Yeah. And I'll do likewise. Thanks, Sarah. I know it off by heart because it's not very long, but... Um, I will just still open it up and give the pamphlet its So this is called Linnaeus and um, it's, it really appeals to me. Dean Brown sent it on to me and um, it just, it, it reminds me of almost the, the humor of a scientist. Like it reminds me of, of, of sort of the repartee that would happen between Richard Dawkins who's someone who influenced Tom and Christopher Hitchens. So I just like it that it's, it, I don't know if you heard of this kind of thing, like a hitch slap. This poem is a little bit like a, a slap. So Linnaeus, death is not an animal. Yep, yeah, th there you go. That's the poem. I love that one. <laughs> it's I, just, it is just, um, it is, as you say, um, very, very, um, very scientific, isn't it? <laughs> it's wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. And when I came to that poem, I did take, I did have a little bit of a, oh, I didn't expect that. Um, thank you for sharing that. 
Thank you. Tom, do you have any advice for um, the poets out there listening to us, wanting to enter competitions, wanting to put together a pamphlet, and um, what would be your, your main um, advice to them? Uh, do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you either do it or you don't do it. And if, you, you know, if, you're, if you're not in, you can't win. So, no, I think you're supporting, um, you know, call it the, the community rather than the industry. You know, if you, if you, I often throw just rubbish into competitions um, just to support them, you know, to pay the fee. Um, you know, if I have nothing, with, you know, with absolutely no expectation of winning or getting long or shortlisted. Um, but, you know. I'm really glad that I have to read those poems. That <laughs> you did, like you that. did. <laughs> 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 so, but, so yeah, just get stuck in, you know, I mean, people are, and, you know, and people are writers tend to be maybe sensitive and shy. Um, and I, you know, I made some comments about the argy bargy of workshops, so people shouldn't take that too much to heart either, because I mean, most workshop facilitators are really quite sensitive and they have a delicate touch and but they're very encouraging. Um, you know, the one I attend is we're kind of all equally robustuous, I guess. So, you know, we, and we've known one another for a long time. So then we can have a, have a bit of argy bargy just for comedy value. But um, no, I mean, I think workshops are great. You know, people you'll see the odd negative comment about them. But I mean, what, what other sphere of human endeavor would you not uh, look to, a, a, you know, an expert, if you like, for training or, or a mentor? So why shouldn't it? Be, you know the same with, with writing um, or creativity. Absolutely, um, I think that's really good advice to get it get stuck in and and get you know become part of the community and or make your own if there isn't anyone um, around. You know there there might be secret poets lurking um, in every corner. Um, thanks so much, Tom um, and Sarah. You might tell us a little bit about the submission window open for June um, at the Well Review. You know, what advice could you give the people listening if they want to submit um, a manuscript and um, any advice? Sure, sure, no problem. Um, I just wanted to include one piece of advice, which is probably not the most um, opposite advice during a literary festival, but that is to, um, at some point, stop reading. Just stop reading because people get really phobic about that. So to just put down other people's books after you've bought all the books on this program and and just literally be with yourself and it they, they i i don't really think the poems are going to come if you keep reading to be honest you have to at some point stop reading my advice <clears throat> for submitting during the pamphlet which is running every day in june so from the first to the 30th just obviously to follow the guidelines um it's it'll just be me and one other person reading them so it becomes it becomes very challenging if someone puts in double or treble the amount of, of the, the sort of uh, poem count and things like that. Um, <clears throat> I announced it quite early because I think it was good for people to work towards it. I would sort of say don't, don't submit poems that you're currently working on, you know, uh, submit poems that have you been with maybe for six months to 12 months. You know, um, Tom will confirm this, but Tom had written his poems over the course of, of eight or nine years. I'm not saying that that timeline has to apply, but poems that have had a little bit of a rest and, you know, that you, poems that you're not writing the week of submission. You know what I mean? So the poems, like I said earlier, poems that are, uh, you know, have reached uh, maturity and can be let out on the world without... Um, uh, over interference, because that's what I don't want. I have a probably, I don't know if this is useful to know, I have a 30% threshold. So if I think that I need to, if I think that the pamphlet needs to be changed more than 30%, that's, I, I don't take it on because I feel like that is is uh, is not fair on the on the author. And it's not fair on me. It's, it's, it's simply, it becomes a collaborative, um, you know, it becomes a, a co-authorship. So, yeah, just send in your wackiest ideas, send in whatever it makes, you know, your life, gives your life meaning, whatever you care about in terms of themes. I'm interested in, in everything, so there's nothing really parameters around that. Just put in mature, developed, excellent poems. <laughs> <laughs> easy peasy, easy, easy peasy. peasy yeah. I think it's really interesting what you said there about to you know not to put down the books and to be with yourself 
because yeah. I think people get very, very anxious around that and that they're afraid that other people will influence them and so on and so on. And I think it's like, isn't it? It's a balance between reading really widely and immersing yourself in literature and then just taking a break and just listening to yourself. I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, because I think particularly if you're nervous or if you're, um, you know, trying to find your voice, that sometimes um, you, you need to read widely and of course, you know, read poetry and read everything that you can get your hands on, but equally give yourself some time and space to allow that to percolate and allow it to settle and to allow it to inform your voice as much as it will or will not. Um, I think that's so interesting. Tom, before we finish up, What's next for you? Are you working on anything at the moment or what's going on? Well, Sarah hasn't ordered me to write anything recently. So <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty busy at the moment with, with uh, pandemics and you know, online teaching and whatnot. So that's been a, I mean, I'm kind of, a, I hesitate to, you know, the way everybody's writing a novel. Well, I'll probably say that and, and leave it. <laughs> you are writing a novel. Sorry? You are writing a novel. Well, 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 everything apart from putting words on a page is... <laughs> well, that sounds very exciting. That sounds brilliant. Um, yeah, and I suppose the pandemic has brought with it more space in some ways and less opportunities in others. But I think certainly as, as the pandemic goes on, it seems like there's more work and less time. Um, which is not what it was at the beginning, certainly. So I think we're actually working a lot harder than we were pre the pandemic in that it's you know all of this work is like encroached upon your home and your life and your your everyday existence and that I think would be interesting as we go forward and um, looking um, at what literature emerges from this time and Sarah just just finally um, the Well Review offers mentorships and courses um, and, and particularly ones there was one you did on walking not so long ago that I think was a beautiful um, accompaniment to the fact that we were all um, confined to 5k and, and to leave our devices at home and to actually go and, and really experience um, our, our environment. So have you any more coming up or is, have you any more plans for that? Yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of that's to do with, I had this whole other career. So, um, and I had this whole other like sort of uh, route into different types of literature, particularly philosophy and psychology. So it's just trying to offer something a little bit different, sort of interdisciplinary kind of textual uh, production and analysis, you know, to get people reading. So we had people reading people like Hannah Arendt over the winter. We had a winter course that was all about sort of um, celebrating winter I suppose and celebrating the darkness of of the seasons and, and creativity so I don't have one planned I know that we're going to run one on sleep in early autumn so sleep and poetry and we're going to have another pamphlet out in August and um, we'll hopefully have out of the June readings we'll have a pamphlet by the end of the year so we have two more pamphlets this year well, so one uh, in translation and one will be selected out of the June reading period. That's, that's wonderful that it's going to be published so soon as well, because I think with a lot of people, when you submit, you're waiting for sometimes two years. Um, so that's very exciting to the people listening that, you know, if you have your pamphlet ready and, and um, you submit it, that you could see it in publication very soon. And who knows, be reading um, from it at Listowel Writers Week, maybe um, very soon and maybe in real life even better. Um, I want to thank you both so much for such a lovely um, conversation and for being so um, generous and open and honest about your processes and about um, all things related to the pamphlet and um, for the time. And just to say, I think it's thewellreview.com, is it Sarah, to look up everything um, in relation to submitting the pamphlet. So, and it's a beautiful website and very easy to, um, to, to use. So do get onto thewellreview.com. You can buy um, Tom's pamphlet there. Brother, brother Adam, um, and you can submit your own. So go forth and submit. And thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, thank Victoria. you so much, Sarah and Tom, and we'll see you again very soon. Bye-bye.